Key. Hair flip. Yeah, I'm a badass bitch. I don't like it. Hair flip. Yeah. Oh my God. So you guys should be happy. Oh my goodness. Hair flip. But anyways, hair flip. And hair flipping on these toes. Hi. than the soft-spoken man I talk with who dreams of having a big family. Sex in the Summer. This is the song that featured the ultrasound heartbeat of your baby. Yeah. What we did was uh, uh, take a microphone and place it on Maite's stomach and uh, move it around with the gel till we get the right mm -hmm. spot. And then, you know, you start to hear that. And then uh, we put the drums around that. When you saw her outside at a concert, I think it was in Germany, and you just said in passing to a friend? I saw her and her mother outside the concert in Frankfurt, and um, I said, that's my future wife. <laughs> just as, you know. Mm -hmm. And what did you think? First of all, you're introduced to Prince, and I understand you all became friends. Mm -hmm. Did you think this is my future husband? No. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. What did you? I met Prince at 16. Maite Garcia tells how the reclusive star waited three years to sleep with her. Garcia tells people that after knowing Prince for three years, he took her virginity. In the new memoir, Prince's ex-wife, Maite Garcia, shares the story of their four-year marriage and the tragedy that tore them apart. Maite was just 16 years old when she met the musical icon Prince, but she says it took years before her ex-husband pursued her romantically. Garcia details the progression of her relationship with Prince, who died in April 2016, in her upcoming memoir, The Most Beautiful People, My Life with Prince, which appears in this week's issue of People. As a successful teenage belly dancer in the 1990s, Garcia delivered a tape of her performing to the singer at one of his concerts in Germany. The star ultimately invited Garcia backstage, telling her, I like your tape. Prince said, writes Garcia, are you really 16? After confirming her age, Prince asks for Garcia's number. That encounter lasted 40 seconds, but it felt like we'd stepped out of time, she says. Later that evening, Garcia says Prince invited her to his hotel where they watch more tapes of her performances. Garcia writes, we did not have a sexual relationship. Now 43, he never denied that the occasional impure thought crossed his mind, but he was too wise and decent to take advantage of a 16 year old girl. Soon after her graduation from high school, Garcia began to work as one of Prince's backup dancers. He subsequently became her legal guardian. At 18, she moved into Paisley Park full time. Despite Prince dating other women, Garcia writes that they would stay in his room until dawn just talking. A year later, when Garcia was 19, Prince declared, I think it's time, directing her to get birth control. A week or so later, I wrote in bold in my journal, February 9th, 1993, not a virgin, she says in the book. And I drew a winking smiley face. Patience pays off. The couple wed on Valentine's Day, 1996, before ultimately splitting in 2000. <laughs> you didn't. What did you think? Well, 
I mean, I was 16 when I met him, so just the idea of meeting him, I was really scared before I met him. Mm -hmm. And then when I met him, I just felt this, I was just calm and I didn't mm -hmm. feel nervous. Maite states that she was 16 years old when she met Prince. Now, I'm not saying that anybody's a predator or anything like that. I'm not trying to speak ill on the dead or anything. I, I want to give respect because Maite has never said anything about them having sex under while she was underage. She never displayed that. Prince met her in Germany. He did not meet her in America. After Prince met Maite, Prince said out of his own mouth during this interview that when he met Maite, he saw his future wife. Prince knew exactly how old Maite was. He even questioned her of her age and she confirmed, yes, I am 16. Soon after, Prince got guardianship over Maite to where she was basically living at Paisley Park with Prince under age. When she turned 18, she moved into Paisley Park full time and then allegedly a year later when she turned 19 prince you know and her started having sex in most people mind it's still pretty you know predatorial to have someone around you underage and kind of just wait around you know until they cross that it's safe to now have sex with them you know type of age most people kind of look at that as creepy it's kind of like adopting a kid at 16 and then once they turn 18 you kind of start sleeping with them you know um People side-eyed it, even Oprah. So when Oprah was there and Oprah asked his Maite, you know, she's like, Maite, you know, isn't this all weird? Like, you know, and, and says the same thing to Prince. And Prince is just like, well, you know, it's dependent on how you look at it. Well, how we're looking at it is that you have been basically around this young lady since she was 16 years old. You were 32. She was he, Prince was 32 years old when he met Maite and she was 16. Okay. Once that happened, Prince, once he met her, the first day he met her outside in Germany, he invited Maite to his hotel room at 16 years old. And she stated that they just watched the movies all night. You know, I don't know. But I'm just stating that it does look a little inappropriate. It does make a person scratch their head. And it does kind of make them wonder. It's just like, what made you want to, you know, it's kind of like he was keeping her around because he knew he wanted to date her. He just couldn't date her yet. So he didn't want anybody else to, you know, come and, you know, take her virginity or be with her. And so he wanted to. And I'm just stating this is just my opinion, you know, and how I look at it, especially with him becoming her guardian, you know, at basically 16 and a half, 17 years old. I just find that a little skeptical, especially with him sleeping with her not even two and a half years later. You know, I mean, she's basically still a kid, but. It's legal. So by being legal, I'm not going to state anything once again. But people were side-eyeing this whole situation. It just did not make sense to a lot of people. Previous life. I feel like she was either my sister or we were the same person or something in another life. It, there's a closeness that, that you know is right and you don't argue with. Well, isn't this all kind of weird? <laughs> well, it depends on how you look at life. I, yeah. It seems to me, I would just say this is a description of the two of you, and when he talks about you, there's a thing that happens in his eyes. I, I do feel I, that I've come closer to who I aspire to be by being with her. Really? Mm -hmm. And what does she do for you that you didn't, that you didn't have alone? She makes it easier to talk to God. Really? Yeah. Oh, I could cry. Mm -hmm. Was it like a traditional ceremony? Like if there's a minister and yes. you take and you say and mm -hmm. till death do us and the whole thing? Mm -hmm. We had a very small wedding. We only invited uh, friends and family, mostly family. And uh, there was a big empty section in the church. And she said that um, she's glad that it was empty because there were uh, enough room for the angels. Is he romantic? He's romantic. Yeah, I'm thinking if he ain't romantic, who is? <laughs> like He's romantic, romantic. How? like rose petals in the, you know, in the bed, in the bathtub, in the. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're just well roses, but for me, the most romantic thing that he's done is is write these beautiful songs for me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's let's have a baby mm -hmm. because of that. I mean, I got pregnant. <laughs>
He said he wants to, in 10 years, he's going to have babies crawling all over him, on his ears and around his neck and calling him daddy. Do you want the same thing? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Never wanted it more. It, 10, you really want 10, you think? It's up to her. <laughs> I hope I get some twins in there so I can <laughs> take a break. <laughs> when you call him, what do you call him? When I met him, I didn't call him Prince. I never called him that because I didn't see him as that person. Called she him. slipped out of that, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do I call him? I never, I, I just talked to him. You know, people always say, well, but what if he, you need him to bring you something, That's pass right. a tea or something. She I just said, say. You say, hey. Hey. <laughs> hey. She says, hey. <laughs> So you just go around the house, you, so you never call him, you never, you never slip and say. Because I never did. Because you never did call him. So it's not a, hey, a big issue for me, it's just, hey. <laughs> Man, I would drop, I would drop the tea if I heard Prince come from the kitchen. I'd... Would you really? Oh man, scare me to death. <laughs> Does he make you laugh? Oh yeah. Is he fun? Yeah. No, I'm Does he tell yes, jokes? Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah. I don't tell jokes, I'm serious. Yeah. No. Really? Heard that the couple's baby boy was born with health problems, and the reports have fans concerned. What is the status of your your, your baby, your pregnancy? Your... Well, I, our family exists. Mm -hmm. um, we're just beginning it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we got many kids to have. Long way to go. And that's all the artist and his wife choose to say at this time. But with that being said, Oprah knew that there was something going on with Prince and Maite's son. I believe it's the main reason why Oprah did not want to reschedule this interview. She kept pushing it and Prince felt the pressure. And I believe that Prince, you know, kind of wanted to show face. And there were so many rumors going on about their child anyway, that he needed a platform, you know, to speak, you know, one time and kind of speak about this just so, you know, it can be over and done. I partially blame Oprah for this situation, for barricading this man and this woman who has just lost the child for you to come here and seek information that isn't necessarily needed. We don't need you to go and disrupt the peace that they're trying to get after losing a child just so you can have tea, just so you can get clout off of this situation. As a woman, I feel that Oprah should have respected Maite and her situation, especially losing a child, and rescheduling this in, this interview, even if she did not know for sure if the baby passed away or not. I still think that even hearing a rumor or anything like that at all, yeah, you should definitely step back. And I don't feel like Oprah wanted to do that. I feel that she wanted the tea. She wanted to be the first person to divulge this information. So I blame Oprah. I think that she's a bad person for what she did. I think that she's not standing for women. I think that it's also negative of Oprah to have, you know, kind of spoke on this in a negative light about my saying Prince basically saying that they lied to her. I don't believe it was more so of lying. I think it was that that they were grieving. You know, that is a really hard thing to go through. And if you've never gone through it, I just feel like you're you could you're like the last person, you know, to judge that type of situation. Um if they wanted to handle that privately as a family, that, that's up to them. We cannot tell them how to grieve. And it's also not our business. Damn sure was not Oprah room freeze. So for her to, you know, do that to Maite, I just find it very discouraging and disrespectful. And when it comes to Prince, I feel that Prince was pushing a certain energy because you have to draw strength from those type of situations. You know, Prince and Maite is pretty much, you know, all they had. You know, they just had each other. So they have to draw strength from one another. And I feel that that's why Prince can do the interview alone he could not do it without my take because they have to show strength if i come down here and do this interview by myself and just speak of you people are going to wonder so you need to be present just as well as me and that's why i believe my take stay quiet Maite did not want to lie to the world, but she was basically still lying, saying it without saying it, you know, but it's still, once again, a very sensitive situation and it's theirs. Like we can't tell them how to grieve the loss of a child. Playroom. And here's my favorite room. The children's to be, the children's to come. Yes, ma'am. The child in you or just the children? Oh, the children's, yeah. And all those rumors about their baby? Well, the artist shared this with us. It's all good. Never mind what you hear. 
I believe in the clip that we just saw, that Prince, well, the clips that we just saw with the baby room and the playroom and all of that. I feel that like that was Prince trying to save face, stating that, you know, we did lose a baby, but we're basically going to have another one immediately. We're, we're going to try our hardest, you know, to have another child right away. So this stuff will not be in vain. You know, we, we're, we're going to try again. We're going to strap our boots up and we're going to have another child. Um, I do feel that Prince kind of looked at um, the next child that Maite got pregnant with because Maite did get pregnant again um, soon after losing their first child, Amir Nelson. She did get pregnant again. Again. And with her being pregnant, I feel that Prince looked at the baby as a replacement baby. I feel that he felt that this baby would fill the void of Amir being gone. And in the process of that, Maite lost that second child as well. She did not carry the baby full term and she ended up losing that child too. So this is a lot of heartbreak and despair, you know, that these two people are going through. Maite wanted nothing more, you know, than to have a child. And Prince wanted nothing more than to have a child. We're a married couple. We have this power palace this you know compound that we can raise as many children as we want in all we have to do is have them and they were having a really hard time um doing that Maite ended up adopting a beautiful child years later um but her and Prince never conceived um a child full term after Amir Nelson if you notice in this clip, Maite says nothing. She looks down and more so and pushing it towards Prince because she knew that Prince did not want to tell the truth about the passing of their son. Maite and Prince had this interview with Oprah in November of 1996. Amir Nelson, Prince and Maite's son, passed away in October. He lived for six days before falling ill to you know his illness and passing away unfortunately he was born with a disability and his poor little body just couldn't handle it so he eventually ended up passing away god rest his soul and as long as his father along with his father i'm sorry as well um too but she says nothing you know she looks down because she's still grieving she's in the process of grieving and losing a child you know um her husband prince you know is in the same situation and it's extremely fresh you know it's been weeks since their child has passed away and now they're already doing one of the biggest interviews with one of the biggest talk show hosts in the world he said he wants to in 10 years he's going to have babies falling all over him on his ears and around his neck and calling him daddy. Do you want the same thing? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Never wanted it more. It, ten? You really want ten, you think? It's up to her. <laughs> I hope I get some twins in there so I can... <laughs> Take a break. <laughs> when you call him, what do you call him? When I met him, I didn't call him Prince. I never called him that. I didn't see him as that person. Call she him. slipped out of that, didn't she? <laughs> yeah, what do I call him? I never, I, I just talked to him. You know, people always say, well, but what if you, you need him to bring you something, That's pass right. a tea or something? She I just said, say, you say, hey. Hey. <laughs> hey. She says, hey. <laughs> so you just go around the house, you, so you never call him, you never, you never slip and say. Because I never did. Because you never did call him. So it's not a, Hey, a you. big issue for me is it say <laughs> man i would drop i would drop the tea if i heard prince come from the kitchen I'd... would you really oh man scare me to death <laughs> does he make you laugh oh yeah is he fun yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. Does he tell yes jokes? you are <laughs> yeah. i don't tell jokes i'm serious yeah. <laughs> no. Really? Alongside his then wife, Maite Garcia, on the Oprah Winfrey Show back in 1996. Little did Oprah know they were hiding a devastating heartbreak the loss of their newborn son. What a story. Mm. Now, 43, Maite is opening up to me about her and Prince's personal tragedies and what it was like to sit down for that now iconic Oprah interview. You go into painful detail about losing your first son. It was. Probably the worst thing that's ever happened in my life. Not long after that, Oprah came to visit Paisley Park. Yes. Meet his new bride. And what do you call him? <laughs> and both of you had to step up and pretend like nothing was wrong. Our faith was really strong. He reassured me that we were gonna try again. We were gonna bring him back. Maite and Prince's son, Amir, who suffered from Pfeiffer syndrome type 2, a rare genetic disorder, was born in October 1996 and only lived six days. In her new book, The Most Beautiful, My Life with Prince, 
Garcia describes the dark day Winfrey came knocking. How's everything? Couldn't be better. Really? Couldn't be better. Yeah. There was a part of me that I didn't want to do it. I, I couldn't. I was like, if I see Oprah, I'm probably going to break down crying. For me, the most romantic thing that he's done is, is right. Let's have a baby mm -hmm. because of that. I mean, I got, preg I got pregnant. <laughs> Let's have a baby. But she wanted the story. Yeah. What is the status of your, your baby, your pregnancy? Your... Well, I, our family exists. Mm -hmm. um, we're just beginning it. If you look at the video, I look at him like, it's on you. Right. Because I'm about to get up and walk away because I, I can't. I can't say it. You tried again afterwards, and that baby didn't come to term. Horrible. After analyzing the situation, I just want to simply state, I have guardianship over a child, okay? Somebody that is under the age of 18. Therefore, I am listed as his guardian. So I'm his father, technically, right? I'm his dad. It's no different with Prince and Maite. If Prince got legal guardianship over Maite, he technically adopted her. When you take guardianship over someone, if you want, you can even change their last name to yours. It's literally bringing them into your family. So with Prince getting guardianship over Maite and dating her three years later, technically he was dating his daughter. Just stating that is facts. That's not an assumption. That's not me sitting here trying to conjure something up. People overlook that. I feel that they did. He got guardianship over Maite when she was 16 on her way to being 17 years old. Pretty much when he met her at 16, they did not separate. Therefore, once he got guardianship, once again, he was listed as basically someone that was a sole provider over her. Somebody that was responsible for her like a parent, not a boyfriend or anything like that, a fiance or anything. So technically, once again, Prince married his adopted daughter whether you like it or not I'm sorry i'm just keeping it frank allegedly there's this urban myth that back in the late 70s early 80s that prince went to the crossroads if you don't know what the crossroads is it's literally a crossroad between heaven and hell earth and other dimensions and allegedly you can meet the devil there and barter with him your soul for something in return, rather fame and fortune or whatever you name, it's usually something ungodly, something that God doesn't bless you with, like money. Money is the root of all evil. So when people say that, oh, I'm thankful, thank you, God bless me with money. No, God doesn't bless you with anything like that. Um, so anyways, so allegedly Prince went to this crossroad. And when you barter with the devil, you have to give some type of collateral until you get to hell, allegedly. And this collateral is not your soul. That's something you hand over when you pass away. You have to give something else in the meantime. And what Prince bartered was having children. He sacrificed having children along with his soul, allegedly, to have fame and fortune. I think, allegedly, how the rumor goes, is that Prince kind of took the devil as a joke once he became a Jehovah's Witness and felt that he could still, you know, have children. Maite, among other women, which Prince has dated a lot of women, and he was also married after Maite. That was not his only wife. And when it came to conceiving, he had a lot of issues. There are other alleged women that were pregnant by Prince and the baby either didn't make it to full term or an early miscarriage. So the, it's it's the urban legend. So let's get into Bob Dylan talking about how he sold his soul to the devil. We'll do it. Why are you still out here? Well, it goes back to the destiny thing. I, mean, I made a bargain with it, you know, a long time ago, and I'm holding up my hand. What was your bargain? To get where um, I am now. Sh should I ask who you made the bargain with? <laughs> with, 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 you know, with the chief, uh, chief commander. On this earth? <laughs> and on this earth and, in, uh, and then in the world we can't see. Prince, the secret backwards message he hid in Darling Nikki. Purple Rain remains one of Prince's most popular albums. One of the most beloved songs from that album is Darling Nikki. At the same time, the track is one of the most infamous songs on Prince's catalog and perhaps in all of the 1980s popular music. The song was scandalous to many, but people 
For its graphic discussion of sex, however, Prince inserted a completely different hidden message into the back end of the track. The meaning of the secret message might surprise fans who remember the song primarily for its sexual themes. Darling Nikki is an extremely risque song. It's about Prince meeting a woman named Nikki who is very interested in him. He gets intimate with her and gets to watch her grind. Part of what makes the song stand out is its sound. Many of the tracks on Purple Rain from I Would Die For You to When Doves Cry sound very polished. Darling Nikki, on the other hand, has a very raw production and gives the song a sense of danger and darkness. An activist and wife of Al Gore learned her preteen daughter was listening to the song. She helped found the Parents Music Resource Center to try to prevent children from listening to music with adult content. Thanks to the PMRC, explicit albums are now saddled with parental advisory stickers. Of course, not all the songs come from its lyrics. The track's composition helped make it notable. Significantly, there's a noise near the end of the track, which many fans found frightening. Near the end of the song, you can hear the eerie sound of a choir singing. They appear to be singing complete gibberish. However, the sound is actually the sound of the choir singing backwards. The secret message in Darlin' Nikki can only be heard if you play the record backwards. Hello, how are you? Given the rest of the song's content, fans may be surprised to know what the secret message is. It's actually a Christian message about Jesus Christ returning at the end of the world. Hello, how are you? Fine, fine, because I know that the Lord is coming soon. Coming, coming soon. This line reflects as a fascination with the apocalypse seen in other Prince songs like Purple Rain in 1999. The song came at the time when some Christians were worried about the prospect of musicians covertly exposing children and teens to negative messages throughout backwards vocals. It was certainly ironic that Prince was using backwards singing to promote Christian ideas. Christians were panicked. Prince managed to combine sex and theology into one song. To some, this is blasphemy. To others, it's just an example of Prince expressing himself in ways few others would. The song Darling Nikki is a song about a sexual encounter with a girl named Nikki, a sex fiend the singer encounters in a hotel lobby, masturbating with a magazine. Prince released many songs that deal explicitly with sex, but many of them went unnoticed because they were not released as singles. So here's the thing, Darling Nikki. Clear Nikki is a representation of the devil, like that's not hard to notice that's very clear that um nikki in the song is a re representation of everything that is evil everything that is bad and she's sitting there trying to provoke prince to join the dark side and prince does in the song he basically joins the dark side so why have this type of song about a sex fiend and at the end of it you put in backwards lyrics about speaking of Christianity and the Lord coming. Not everybody God is Jesus Christ. Some people's God is Lucifer. They look at him in the same nature, you know, it's heaven and hell, yin and yang, you know, one or the other. Some worship above, some worship below. So that is pretty much like what this song is giving. So that's why a lot of people state, you know, in his music alone and a lot of Prince's lyrics, which we will get into in the next video, is in how he liked to talk about the devil and invoke the devil. Um, so we will be breaking down other songs and getting into other songs in the next video. So make sure you come and check that out. What? Was, um, here's a song called uh, Let's Go Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. 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 And it says, don't let the elevator bring us down. Uh, One time when I was with him privately, he yeah. said, you know what the elevator is, right? No. I said, no, what's the elevator? He said, well, the elevator is the devil, right? Oh. It scared me. You know, I don't like to talk like that, but he said that. And so for me, it was like really haunting 
When I read that he was found in an elevator.